Um, uh, I think that your microphones are muted, the panelists. Um, welcome uh, to today afternoon's uh, roundtable talk with uh, Thailand's leading architects of 2020 and perhaps for the past uh, 10 up to 20, 30 years in some cases. Um, the topic of today's discussion is architecture in Thailand in the age of Anthropocene. And um, before we get started, I would like to ask anybody who is listening, the audience, to participate in our roundtable chat by um, um, sending your questions to the Q&A tab. Um, my name is Pratana Keopatinon. I'm an instructor and program coordinator at INDA, the International Program in Design and Architecture, Jalalukon University. I'll be moderating the talk today. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce our panelists quickly. Um, and then they will each introduce themselves through a selection of their work. So we'll start with um, Kun Chana Sampalang. Um, uh, Kuntana is a partner at A49, um, one of the most prominent architectural practices in Thailand. Um, A49 is not necessarily an, only a pioneer, pioneer in our profession, but it has also been an incubator for many architects and educators in the field. Um, A49 is continually being rewarded numerous, numerous prizes internationally and locally for their directions in um, design excellence and, and um, um, in this uh, Anthropocene age, in, also in the area of energy conservation. Um, Kuntana has also been elected very recently, uh, the president of ASA, which is the uh, Association of Siamese Architects earlier this year. Um, we hope to both hear about his work and his vision for the professional development of Thai architects um, in this precarious time. Next, we have Kun Chat Pong Thun He's a founder of Thai Architects, an 11-person practice he started in 2012. Um, his work uh, include a variety of smaller scale projects, many residential, some commercial designs like offices and hotels, and also um, some several schools. We also know him by his um, outstanding research um, initiative called Bangkok Bastards, um, an informal investigation into organic architecture and city spaces um, that are made without architects. So user-generated um, architecture and, and, and spaces. Um, aside from his award-winning um, practice, he's also heavily involved in other platforms of design communication, such as teaching locally and abroad, his, um, he has also been involved with exhibition curating, uh, lecture moderating, etc. Um, but most recently, he has just um, received the Silapathon Award. Um, it's an award honoring a contemporary artist in the field of architecture um, for their achievement. So um, congratulations, Pat. Um, next, uh, last, we have Ajahn Boon Sir Pada. I'm calling him Ajahn because we uh, teach at the same university. He is in the interior architecture department. Um, he also had his um, education starting out in the area of um, interior architecture. Um, and if I have to guess, that's probably where uh, a lot of his projects are focused on materiality, um, tactility in a very personal scale. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, in a little bit. Um, Ajahn Bun Sum leads a very unique practice of a full team of two full-time employees and a rotating uh, team of apprentices. Um, and like the other two architects, Ajahn Bun Sum's projects have received countless awards, but perhaps the one that is most reflective of his vision uh, are the Brick Awards uh, for his design of the Gantana Institute. Um, I've asked each of the panelists to introduce themselves um, for, or with a five minute presentation. Um, uh, also a selection of a um, present, presenting also a selection of a project that they feel is relevant to this topic of Anthropocene. Um, so under this uh, very limited time, it's a way for us to um, specific, specifically frame our, our presentations. So we will start with Kun Chanak. Uh, then following up with Kun Chat Pong and to end with Ajahn Kun Se. So um, Kun Chanak, you're welcome. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, I will introduce myself again. My name is Chana Sampalang. I represent myself today of uh, like uh, board committee of uh, A49. Maybe I share my screen a bit about my uh, so just uh, uh, oh, we 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 as I. How I can view people's screen? I don't know how. How can I share my <laughs> my screen? But uh, there I, you are. I do my best, Natha. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. Good. Is that full screen yet? Uh, not, okay, yet. not yet. Okay. Yeah. That's good. All blackout. Okay. That's good. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm one of the managing director of a A49 company. We call it 49 Group, which is have like a 14 company within our team design. But uh, I taking care to two company. One is a A49 HD, which is uh, doing about like house design, and then another one is a A49 Phuket, which is like another uh, southern part of Thailand. And then also like a uh, Ajahn said, uh, I just elect as a President of ASA uh, just a month ago. So I don't know yet about what is the duty of the president right now, but try my best to cope everything, solve everything, make it like light up in the uh, correct direction. That is a uh, part that I uh, uh, work right now. So it's more or less like a three company together to run for everyday life of the time right now. So that that is briefly about myself and then my company. Should I talk more about the project? Yes, please. Just, right just one one project, maybe for five minutes. Maybe just a one picture that I think uh, we can share. That um. So we we have one project recently that uh. Uh, work on and then just done. I'm not sure how to I make a full screen. Yes, uh, from from my uh, professional work, I think I, I've been in this professional for almost like 30 years. Uh, start from uh, when I graduated from Chalalungkorn University up until now, which is I stay with one company only. The house design is something that it gradually changed according to people life technology and their belief or lifestyle which is a uh, from very previous house uh, when I graduated from school it's more or less like a Thai people have some certain belief and then some certain uh, lifestyle that they that they related to the past like a uh, uh, Thai people love to live in uh, through ventilation so on they're gonna have a place where uh, guests have to be outside the house and then the private zone have to be totally private uh, save themselves save their uh, family away from from whatever that might harm them but now the house gradually changed uh, it's like it, it start from from a small family first in the last 30 years many uh, everyone who, who graduate or who has a family once that they grow up they want to get their own small house just for one one family maybe three or four with a mother and father and then that is a thing that uh, shape architecture style about housing design that we do a small house we do a single family kind of style up until now like 30 years past I think living living Lifestyle is changed a lot. Like now, what, what we do from the, the last project that we do, it's like the house is not for only one single family, but it's gathering place for family. So uh, multiple family would live in un under one roof because of some reason that changing from the past. Maybe because of they want to taking care of their own mother who getting old, or maybe sometime when they are wealthy enough, they want to back to be back together as full house family again. So thing is changing, it's shifting according to culture and according to age. To me, it's like age is one thing, culture is one thing. And then another thing is being an Asian is something unique, yes, in terms of designing that kind of influence how architecture changing itself. That is a part of my brief. 
Thank you, Ka. I think that you you raised a very um, a very poignant um, uh, issue of the aging society. You know, as a as um, as a as a dimension of the Anthropocene. So um, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, next, um, we will go with Kun Chat Pong Ka. Pio, you have to stop sharing. Yes, I have to stop thank sharing. you. Hello, so I'm Chat Pong Chin Rudimon. I hope my iPad technology is up to par. Um, I sent a few images into the conference, um, and hopefully, if it doesn't work where I can't share images, um, the files that I sent, perhaps you can post them for me. Ajahn Pat, I don't know um, if you talked to Kun Min, but let me try first if I can share my screen. <laughs> Ajahn Pat, do you know if, if you've received the images that I sent you? I'm sorry. I never received in any images, actually. I'm oh. um, sorry. Oh, I think the team may be sharing. Ah, the team has received the images. Um, can I have the next image first? The, 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 there's another image uh, I sent alongside with this one. While we're searching for the image, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Chat Pong, Chat Pong Chunri Dimon. And um, yes, thank you. Um, my office is a small one called Chat Architects. Uh, I guess we're kind of uh, a little strange uh, in the way we work. Uh, we do. Uh, a lot of research, uh, pretty much not because I am academically inclined or because I like to research, but because I feel the need to kind of teach myself uh, about the authentic uh, architecture uh, in Bangkok and in Thailand in order to do better design work. Um, so one of the projects that um, we started about six or seven years ago is a research project where we go out and survey, measure, and draw what I call street architecture, um, affectionately named Bangkok Bastards. So they're pretty much structures like this. This is basically a construction worker house uh, that is design constructed by normal everyday people. In this case, it's usually construction workers who uh, try to basically get by and solve everyday problems. Um, by using scavenged materials, farm materials, sheep materials, old telephone poles, old wood and structure to create a kind of necessary housing. And we research these um, basically elements to teach ourselves about uh, the strategies of creating space and architecture in Bangkok and utilize some of these techniques uh, in order to um, uh, create uh, an architecture that we feel is authentic so one of the lessons we learned from uh, Bangkok Bastards is uh, from the construction worker houses. Uh, we uh, found that there's a lot of circulation elements we call scaffolding uh, that is used as multi-purpose space to access all these different rooms. And we basically try to incorporate the strategy into creating our own architecture. So if I can have, have the next slide that uh, we showed earlier, um, of how we integrated the scaffolding uh, or veranda components into uh, our design. So if you can go back, yeah. It was a slide that you showed the first time. So uh, this is actually a poster we made for uh, a building, uh, an adapted reuse project. Uh, it's an old uh, Thai typology called the Curtain Sex Motel, kind of a dark program. So we uh, renovated this project. Um, it's a hotel that has kind of 
uh, CD program inside uh, in terms of kind of prostitution or whatnot. But we basically tried to turn this building inside out from a very mysterious dark building into a building that opens itself up to the street and reactivates street life. And we do so by basically reintroducing the scaffolding that I mentioned earlier uh, that we extracted from the construction worker house. So in this case, you'll see the image where the scaffolding has become kind of a new uh, uh, MEP service uh, catwalk that also doubles as a vertical stage. So the hotel operators are basically, in this case, uh, uh, putting together a neighborhood concert of singers and dancers that are lined up on the vertical stage to entertain the street neighborhood. So this is how our research has kind of led to a kind of more public friendly architecture. Thank you. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Start with the slide. About yes. um, the my current work and uh, it's just a computer. Okay, and the uh, first picture, the first picture is and uh, it come from and the visitor, the visitor and uh, the site is just the uh, computer. Uh, I like this picture because it and it, it comes translated the idea uh, for me and this project. The project is the elephant world. It's, which, it's a human, which we are the human and which we and uh, the elephant. My architecture is like at the black cow. So, and I think that it, and the architecture is, for me, it's very, very small piece. It's not, an, it's not it's a big thing or a big story. But it supported its life and behind the scene, its relationship between the human and the animal. And the project is, is comprised on the, the museum. It is an elephant museum. It's, uh, the museum is talking about the life of an elephant and the Kui people in the Kui village, the situation in the Sulin province. It's my project is not in the city. It mostly it's and situated in a uh, rural. It's like and uh, the sum is another project. It's, it's the same size but it's another building. It is and a tower. The tower is made for and it's like it's not in the thick tower. It's about the rural tower. It's the tower in the rural, in a, among its like and uh, national research forest. So and this tower is designed for and the uh, light and the people you do up in the, in the top and right and look to the crowd to see and the elephant is surround is surrounded. This is and the idea is after my idea that I wish to make it the tower it light and the first tree in light like, in the wasteland because it and uh, this forest it, it's a former forest it was destroyed by a human because it's a human it want to and uh, plant it like it for and uh, make it a plant it for a sale for make it the money for an uh, economy and after that is and we have to and the forest was it destroy everything so it and the first tower is like and um, just the idea it, being and the people is on the top and grow the seeds from the tree and in Thailand we call the young tree and it's a chair it's like a helicopter. So it's the uh, last one is an, another building it's like and uh, the elephant courtyard it's like a uh, big roof it's under it's a landscape it's like a platform it's a crowd firm into a light and a theater. This is under my idea that it, uh, my architecture is related to uh, the, the rural area or the countryside. Thank you. 
ขอบคุณค่ะอาจารย์ Thank you so much for sharing your uh, the meaningful projects uh, with us um, I think that you guys have already started to frame the parameters of um, our discussion uh, this afternoon um, I I guess I'm going to start the chat by addressing that, you know, the, you know, for the audience that the age of Anthropocene um, has required us to view architecture uh, slightly differently, right? And that um, there is an ecological aspect of design and architecture that we have to be more aware of. Um, we have architects that um, like Shigeru Ruban, who has been pioneering sustainability for 20 years, um, who has also pursued humanitarian projects. We have Julia Watson, through her movement, Low Tech, has um, been studying anthropology and the indigenous context and um, design. Right? So we have um, forensic architecture um, founder is um, Ayo uh, Wiseman, who's turned architectural practices and methodologies into investigative tools. So um, the, the, the way that we view and, and um, practice architecture has been broadened out to um, areas that were un unimagined, maybe like 10, 10 years ago. Um, or even in a less formal um, context of architectural schools, right? We've had uh, in in uh, we have the famous Sathapatkalakorn, um, right? So we, where where the um, the students are involved in um, creating and producing annual plays. We have Kai um, Asa um, every summer break. You know, where the students go out to the communities very far from Bangkok, um, work with the work with the villagers and and um, uh, design and build uh, 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 community spaces for them. Um, so we see that uh, in uh, architects have many opportunities to participate outside of their own architectural practices. Um, so. My my question is, um, in addition to in addition, maybe maybe we can expand a little bit from your from your slide presentation, how you're representing yourself outside of being a practicing architect. Um, perhaps uh, how do you broadcast your message um, reg in regards to the Anthropocene? Right? Who first? <laughs> I think that you had started no. to. I think that you had started to talk about it, um, perhaps in in your in your slide presentation just now. You know when we when yeah. you talked about the relationship between architecture that goes into the background of the community or the landscape. Yeah. Um, you yeah. um, so you um, it feels like your architecture is a an act an, an active uh, participant in the community or the landscape, but it takes a rather a back seat. Right. So, um, how 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 do you see how do you see this role? Not necessarily as an architect, but perhaps a, a facilitator in the community. Um, for me, um, uh, it, it's my it's, it's my way. And uh, I think it's an, uh, when I work it, it I, I think about I'm not an architect. Like an uh, um, borderless, you know. And sometimes it's an uh, I work light and uh, the idea is to come from the small thing. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, the idea is to come from and uh, the the people it's like that we call and uh, one of my research is called that a non architecture that decided by the non architect. Um uh this is and uh, the the way that it's and uh, I I I start to and uh, the, the, my work is called topic. Anyway, it's an, uh, my background is uh, it's come from a technical school, so and uh, it's my my idea of my work is um, it's talking about and um, and um, light and not the architect, it's light and uh, what we call the uh, architectural worker because it and uh, I interesting about the I interesting about and uh, light and the real skill. So and that is related like and uh, your topic is about with uh, the the first is the animal. So and like and the elephant and the animal and related with and uh, the the human. How to relate it? Because it's a long time. So I think it can uh, it is my my interest.
I can take it from there. Yes, please. Okay. It seems natural to follow a Tambu Surum as uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, the idea of architecture um, for us has to be localized and easier, easier to grasp. I, I, I think architecture, especially in the age of kind of the virtual world, the internet where information is spread very fast, um, everybody, designers and non-designers have to ar understand architecture on their own terms. Uh, so you don't have to have a high degree or have to be educated at the university level to understand uh, simply what architecture is. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why we started doing this research called Bangkok Bastards, which are basically simple street uh, architecture, built structures that you can find as soon as you step out your front door on the street in Bangkok. Um, they may be messy, whether they're construction worker houses or shanty towns or whatever, but they teach lessons where uh, the people who build them who aren't designers use very limited resources nearby, cheap, sometimes free, sometimes stolen, <laughs> to create an architecture of immediacy, uh, something that solves a problem very quickly. And I think if you take from those lessons, uh, in this age and epoch, it's a good lesson to learn to do things with resources that are very local, reusing things from steel, wood, to recycling buildings uh, that are, uh, for example, shop houses that are 60% empty in Bangkok um, that we don't see the full potential of, especially on their upper levels from the second floor to the third or the fourth floors. These are all uh, resources that are just under our noses that we sometimes uh, look past to, mm -hmm. in order to embrace more uh, kind of spectacular, sustainable, quote unquote, resilient, quote unquote, tactics that are a lot of hassle, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So I think just uh, for us, looking around us very close by and and learning lessons from how locals do things is very valuable to address the problems in this age. So um, in, 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 in this, uh, through this research, I feel like you are also putting on your curatorial uh, cap a little bit by highlighting um, some of these um, street uh, projects, right? You're putting in the forefront and you're giving them value. Um, you know, so how, how, who do you think your consumers are of, of this uh, documentary? Uh, I didn't know. I, at first, I thought I was the only consumer. <laughs> I didn't think people cared about it. Uh, but I think the consumers for me are young people. I think this language that isn't theoretical based, that is something that's very immediate and easily understandable, young generation, new students grasp very quickly uh, because there are, they are, they're savvy about common day occurrences. They're not so theoretical based in terms of design as my generation or older generations were. They, I think they like the fact that architecture is relatable to everyday life because I feel the younger generation of architects don't draw the line between everyday life and high design anymore. Everything bleeds in to each other. You know, they design buildings, but they grow vegetables, they go backpacking, they travel everything becomes one topic. So for them, a slum or construction worker house isn't so far away from high design. And I think that's hopefully what attracts it, them to, to the research. Yeah. Yeah, I might, I might, I might be uh, different from, from both of them. <laughs> that's great. Start, start, with, start with something like, uh, because Chan Pat talking about uh, Kai Asa, which is like, a, a long name before the time to me, and then Tapat uh, Galakorn, which is the best performance, which is, I, I just remind myself that, yeah, I'm in that in every activity that university have it, and then it's kind of shaped me, shaped myself sometime about how I see architecture. I don't know, I, I just uh, remind me back to when I was a student, I was interested in everything. I studied, I interested in uh, making a state design. 
I instead in uh, making like a, a small school for kids in like very uh, far away neighborhood up outside outskirts of uh, Thailand. Those kind of thing kind of I don't know. It teach me something. It teach me how to say thing like a uh, very element. Put it together. Put it for some purpose. And then those made me come today as like a, a managing director of a, one of the, the, the biggest company in Bangkok, which is a, a picture to me. And then, and, then, and then again, not only the, the professional company that I run to, they also be part of a president of ASA, which just make me feel like, yeah, architecture kind of related to people in many directions in the way to improve their life, the way to improve their community, and then the way that related to culture of each country. Because I look back to my work nowadays, I'm not deciding only the Thai people or Chinese people, but we have work everywhere like Dubai, we have work in India, we have work in China. Bhutan. Bhutan, yes. And then most of them is differently and then it kind of intrigued me, kind of make me fun, make me feel like design never ending. Design is also have something influence us as a designer, as a to creating a new architecture form or function mm -hmm. or even to support mm -hmm. their life, which is a, as a president of ASA again, because the architecture may be not just the, the, the building, maybe it's not a building, it build people. Maybe it's just uh, some programming. So I, I think to me, part of myself become more, I don't know how, how I put myself, it's like a managing architecture kind of person or directing, directing to create something architecturally, which is uh, that what every day that I always work nowadays because we've got so many projects in hand, so many uh, events that we have to help. Help, sometimes we help people to like restore uh, the old house that was destroyed by unintentionally, as you know, the news lately. And sometimes we have to uh, recreate a neighborhood to make it lively again, to make it not dead according to COVID. And then sometime in uh, last month or last two or three months, we have to help uh, doctor or, or community to survive from COVID. Those kind of thing is like architecture is being everywhere, not just a designing space or not just make a use of it, or maybe something that we we have to consider of uh, maybe in the future. I might think I might think myself as like a uh, someone who make architecture that not destroy environment. Because like uh, we we work in this uh, professional for a very long time. Like myself is like for almost thirty years. And then I feel like when we do something, something has been gone, of course, we have to make it more value than what is been gone. And then along the way of it, we make a lot of waste. We create something that pollute our society in many ways, like in ice, as an eyesore or as a weather bad, or even create more garbage in terms of a construction thing. This is something that I, I think uh, uh, the world would shifting because of, of the, the, the disease that we have today, right? The weather that we have today. And then sometimes those kind of things around ourselves would might form architecture in another way. Mm. Architecture that not architecture, architecture that being uh, solve the problem. This is, this is that, that thing that I just uh, touched when uh, Ajahn Pat talking about childhood, <laughs> about uh, activity in school that uh, yeah. make me... Yeah, I, I think that um, what you have um, addressed right now just, uh, also um, answered my my the next question on 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 my notes, which is um, the uh, about the statement that you know um, the best architecture sometimes is the one that's not built, and I think that you each has addressed it in your own way. Um, I you know we 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 have a very short time for our discussion, so I I um, I. I want to have a um, quite a moment for two questions. One, which is about addressing the context of Thailand, because I think that's a unique opportunity we have Thai architects, uh, whether or not um, you feel that practicing in Thailand 
in uh, what we feel as uh, a still active field of operation has advantages over perhaps practicing in more developed countries. Um, and then we have a question from Q&A, which is to, to address the uh, kind of CAD part, the computer-aided design part of your practice, and whether or not it has influenced the way that you manage your projects and the uh, project resources somehow. You can choose to answer either one. I am trying to uh, be really inclusive here. I might start first. <laughs> yes. For the second uh, question, because I think that's what I use most in every day. I think CAD is something I would call is a past now. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about CAD, you mean AutoCAD, right? The thing that we use as a tool or, or the way that we, we work right now in company. But now to me, we, we go beyond that. We, we're doing computer system as, uh, we, we call it a ray with a beam. It's not just uh, a part of a, oh, I, I'm, I'm the one who being, have, have life start from uh, drawing with hand, recording everything in head or in the note, and then again uh, we, we walk past to uh, if if someone uh, born <laughs> as I I was, we can see AutoCAD or we can see computer system to to draw to make a drawing as a green light green line. That's a very primitive one. And then now we go to AutoCAD kind of computer aid system that that help us to make a documentation. And then from today and beyond, I think uh, the system that we might need, we need things that generate everything, generate energy, generate uh, a drawing, generate an uh, accurate section or, or predict whatever happened in the future, even down to the pause estimation or the detail that, that that's very complicated. It needs to sing and then people like when they work, in A49, we have to work across the world. And then people, people work in different timelines. And then like um, I do uh, one design in Bangkok right now, another guy working in Brazil, and then another guy working in a uh, foster office over there in US. And then the, we kind of uh, wake up and then we see things changing. We see things uh, working all along the way. It's like, a, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite amazing to me, and then it's quite complicated. It's like now, uh, as architect life, I have no way to stop working. I think I working twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. And that, and that, that is at the help <laughs> of CAD. Um, <laughs> yes, it helps. Maybe we we running out of time, me. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, perhaps if um, Kun Chat Phong or Ajahn Bun Sir would have a, a last comment or to address the questions or anything. Um. Sure. Um, I think maybe addressing the first issue, how is it working in Thailand? Um, it's great working in Thailand. It's great working in Southeast Asia because of all the crazy stuff that happens all around that is inspiration uh, uh, of a developing country uh, where you find unexpected things uh, on the street. But also I enjoy, I see Thailand not only just as an isolated country, but all the countries in Southeast Asia that are kind of share a brotherhood and sisterhood from Malaysia to Vietnam to Indonesia. I feel like we're all working in similar languages and conditions and um, it would be great to expand our localness outside of the countries that we're working in and to share with each other with other neighbors in Southeast Asia. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Last yeah, note, you I have think, to close this, this session. Yeah, I have the question to ask you about, and uh, that is your question. You know, because it's an, uh, you know, do you think it's an, uh, should we have the doctor in our country? The doctor. Yes. Yes. Because it's and we have to pay attention, you know. We have to pay attention, have the sick people to, in, 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 in everywhere. So we have to uh, sick people, so we need a doctor. If we build, we have to build the architecture. That is, and it's the the idea that is asked about uh, now the build or unbuild in in the idea of the of the Anthropocene. Uh, I think and um, for me, when I think about Anthropocene, 
it should have or not have. It depends on and necessary. It depends on necessity. I feel that everything it must have the reason why, and it's very important for an our country because if the, our country is like an unfinished country. If you talking about and this idea is in a finished country, it's okay maybe, but. It for me that is my question is about the doctor, the girl and the sick people. That is, I think it's an it's very important to and uh, when you measure everything that is, it should make a sense. Well, I, I think that you know in this day and age, it's 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 not necessarily only about the doctor, but it's only it's also about preventive care. And about how the uh, the people also put, uh, take better care of themselves, right? And I, I hope it's true too for architecture. And earlier when we, did, we were discussing the consumers of architecture, um, I hope that um, you know uh, the, the the consumers are are more um, are more uh, participatory in in the area of design and, and architecture. So um, that's um, to end on a hopeful note. I, I wish to thank um, all the panelists. I wish we had another two hours. Um, hopefully we'll meet uh, perhaps at, outside together at one point and we can continue our conversations there. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you. So thank you. you. Thank you. Thank bahas MA ya Mas Ligi ya hari ini ya. Ya. Hari ini kita bahas untuk MA season yang kedua di mana ini merupakan uh, Hi everybody. Does my audio work? Yes, I can hear you, Christoph. Okay. Then let's begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome to session 8B, Theory, Philosophy, and Methodology. Um, I'm Christoph Kroller. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong. And I've been given the honor to chair this session, which is probably the most difficult session that we have um, because we have 11 papers and 45 minutes to cover. Um, luckily, none of those have excessive imagery because we're in the theory, philosophy, and methodology uh, uh, chapter. Um, all the papers that we'll be discussing today deal somehow with agency, which I would say is the ability to act or how we can increase our ability to act through either an analytical assessment 
of current methods, the development of new concrete tools or broader general approaches. And my take on this is that this um, kind of reflects that we are in a post-digital age where the main focus shifts from the development of radically new paradigms to finding ways to increase impact by advancing into practice informed by uh, working with computers for uh, several decades now. And um, so the plan that I have for this session is to use the 45 minutes to create a guided conversation using the produced papers as a backbone. Um, and what I'll do is I'll give each of the panelists three, three and a half minutes each to uh, basically lead a structured conversation um, and that may lead to some dialectics. So um, throughout the whole sessions, panelists can chime in at any time if they want to. And time permitting, we'll have a group conversation um, at the end. Um, I've asked all the uh, paper authors to very briefly present what their research paper is about, kind of give it the caption or the elevator pitch. Um, and then to see how you can place it in this context of agency. Why are you currently doing the type of research that you're doing? What are you hoping to achieve through it? And also to reflect back on how uh, um, the conversation has been going on up until um, that point in time. Um, so as I mentioned, we have um, 11 papers here. Let me see if I can move my windows to the side, okay. Um, and um, I have restructured the order that we saw online in um, uh, the list, um, trying to group them to allow for this conversation to arise. So we'll first talk um, through the four authors that have, through their papers, advocated for a type of general approach um, to dealing with computational design technology. Then we're gonna go to two papers that are focusing more on the analysis of methodology um, in their work. Then we'll have four uh, papers that are talking to about a specific type of tool development. And then at the very end, we're gonna go to uh, the president of Cadre, uh, Candy Hare, to talk about the future of where we're heading um, with all of this. So. Um, let's begin uh, with the first paper. So in the chapter of general approaches, there's different approaches to the challenge of finding increased agency um, in, in, in the different papers that we've seen. Um, and I'll start by giving the floor to Jun Sik Kim and Kevin Sweet with the paper Mass Tailorizations Through Three Analogies, Resolving the Paradox of Choice in the Architecture Design Process Through the Digital Continuum of Mass Tailorization. And maybe um, I'll immediately give them uh, a pass on, on a question um, whether or not they believe that more is more, that we need more technology in order to be able to handle the technology that we're dealing with. Um, authors, can you please state the floor? I hope that you are here. Do we have the authors present? No. Let me see, I see that we have a rather small pool of people. Okay, then, well then let's, um, if somebody can give me a heads up if they uh, come back and then we can come back to the first uh, paper or maybe I can quickly tell what they were working on. So uh, in, in this paper, they're presenting three different um, 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 examples of how computational design um, is uh, generating a, a, a huge amount of data and how we can use computation to assist the filtering through this data um, to make more appropriate uh, design uh, uh, responses. So that would be uh, the summary of it. Um, Okay, um, I'm quickly checking on the messages here to see if, there, if anybody popped up, but nobody has. Okay, so then uh, we'll have to move on to um, the second uh, paper, um, which is Computational Tools in Architecture and Their Genesis, the Development of Agent-Based uh, Models in Spatial Design, which is a paper that's advocating for multi-agent systems to tackle the tacit explicit knowledge confrontation um, that we have here. So I think uh, Nadja Goudier, are you present? Yes, I am. Hi. Okay, great, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you, Christopher, for the for heading the session, which um, 
seems to be headed very nicely. Um, so I will briefly sum up what I've been up to with that paper. Um, I'm aiming at a contribution uh, to a history of computational tools in architecture, and I'm interested in particularly in the current phenomenon of democratization. So basically, what does it mean to try and have more and more architects and designers using those tools? Um, at large, I'm interested in studying two types of biases, technical biases, so the context of emergence of those tools, their algorithmic structure, their interface, have an impact on how architects and designers use them, and the ideas of to question that. Um, and I'm also looking at epistemological biases, um, assuming that the user and developer knowledge profiles, backgrounds, and their ideological positionments toward the nature of architecture also obviously influence what we um, make of them. And so the present paper is a case study for the multi-agent system, so I'm looking at their historical development and both type of biases by looking at basically what multi-agent system is, so what kind of rules it requ requires um, architects and designers to use, and the structure of interfaces of the various um, plugins and so on we have that allow using multi-agent systems. Um, and my hypothesis looking at all this data is that um, these types of algorithms have been especially hard to democratize if we compare them to other typologies, but they favor a form of appropriation by architects rather than pushing systems of rationalization of the practice as many current tools do. So in this sense, it's very much a question of agency and I think it's a very, um, it's particularly suitable notion to use for my work. Um, and on, on a more broader, larger topic, um, Christoph asked us why this research and what we were hoping to achieve through that. Um, so the first goal I have is to look at what kind of data we can um, obtain if we apply science studies methodologies to the study of the computational turn in architecture. So in this sense, the present paper is very much an example of how we could do that and the kind of methodologies we can develop. Um, and the second thing is I'm interested, as Christoph mentioned, in the tacit explicit tension that creates when architects use computational tools. Um, the, um, this is a question that has had a very large place in the debate in early research uh, into computational design for architecture. So the idea that programming is a crafting activity, that creativity has a role to play um, in all this. Um, so all this, uh, what Christopher Alexander often calls the quality without the name, um, could all actually be understood as um, tacit knowledge and the role it plays in architectural design. And I'm basically interested in how um, it appears in, in the algorithm architect use. And if I'm interested in analyzing this as I'm doing in this paper, it's to see if, um, based on that analysis, we could create computational design tools that function on a different basis than what is today the case. So today we aim at um, expliciting most of the data, we aim at creating um, logic structures that are based on, on quantifiable processes, but architecture in itself is a discipline that is based also on much more hardly explicitable elements. And so the idea is to have a look at analyzing those things and then maybe creating tools based on this analysis. Yeah, that's for me for now. Thank you. you know, I, can, I can follow up with a quick question and we can do that all the way through the session. Um, I have two questions actually for you. Um, one is with the change of the um, environment in which we're all operating with the advent of graphic uh, scripting tools like uh, Grasshopper. Um, the focus on console-based or text-based scripting has, has dropped quite a bit. It's only very specialist users nowadays, if we really want to generalize it, um, um, that, that, that still uh, extensively work through console-based or text-based um, scripting. And it's my impression, and, and it's a question too, if, I'm, uh, if, if I could be wrong in this, that before 2007 or 2008, that there was maybe a greater uh, proliferation of agent-based scripting because it requires such a deep uh, or a deeper knowledge of, of data structures in order to create environments where emergence of um, new uh, uh, unpredictable outcomes can become possible. Um, so do you think that the, the, the current 
popularity of uh, different scripting methods, graphic scripting methods, is affecting um, the widespread of agent-based scripting. Um, and I'm asking this because in your own paper, you mentioned at one point, or in the video as, at least, um, that there's a, a limited industry engagement with agent-based design. And in the diagram that's on the screen right now, there's a few very successful practices or examples that are mentioned in there, um, like Kuku um, like Jeff, for example, or, or Roland Snooks and how they're working with it. But it seems to be a field that is smaller than one would have anticipated in the late 2000s when it was uh, very popular or more popular maybe than it is today. What's your, what's your take on that, on the future of agent-based scripting? Um, so first, what you uh, summed up from um, what I'm looking at in my research, it's exactly that. So the switch to um, more graphic-based um, programming process is absolutely um, pushed backward the development of um, agent-based design tool. What also can be added is that you're, uh, you mentioned 2007, 2008, and it's also the moment where we see the switch to Rhino. Um, so there, there has been a massive switch, even in um, skilled practitioners that know how to program. At some point, they all switch to what Rhino, which obviously encouraged then Grasshopper and dynamically linked load libraries rather than text-based scripting. And to me, it's precisely why um, multi agent systems have started being less popular. Mm -hmm. um, I very um, br I briefly mentioned in the presentation the, the structure of interfaces that dynamically linked loaded libraries allowed and the fact that um, if I submit it very quickly for the rest of the people listening um, there is much of the details of a multi-agent system based um, algorithm that you cannot control with the structure of plugins that are in, in Grasshopper you would need to go deeper um, and so I mentioned I'm interested in designing software or plugins based on my research and one um, lead I'd like to explore in particular to see if it's possible to push multi-agent system into a larger democratization is to see if basically we can um, structure the layers of an interface to sort of push the user little by little deeper down so that sort of the user would first um, use maybe a user interface and then be led into a dynamically linked load library type of interface and then into scripting. So it's really guide into the complexities. And in order to do that, which is uh, something that is not very much often done yet, is to look at UX design. And basically in like usual phone interfaces, apps, how do you push people to get to do something? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that, this is one of the ideas I'd like to push. Great, maybe we can come back to it at the very end when we're talking about the future of uh, um, the direction where we're heading. Thank you, Nadja. Uh, let's move on to the third paper by Nicole Gardner, Leo Linmeng, and Hank Heusler. Computational pragmatism, computational design as a pragmatist tool for the age of the Anthropocene. Um, are the authors present and can they take over the mic? Hi, Christoph. Um, Leo and I are present. I can only stay for a few minutes because I have to rush off and pick up my son. Um, and Hank is chairing the other session. So we've got a bit of a clash. Okay, Nicole, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, our paper. Um, the paper is um, considering uh, tools and methods of computational design, I guess, through the lens of uh, the philosophy of pragmatism and really asking, um, I guess, what that offers us um, in understanding how we can uh, start to, yeah, rethink the way we design to address the issues that we're faced with um, in, our, in our current climate. And the argument being that because in effect, um, pragmatism offers an interactional ontology and it, uh, is a philosophy that thinks seriously about how, about action in the world and um, how uh, uh, technology um, from that perspective is, is seen as a way to understand action in the world. So we interpret uh, computational design um, tools and methods, or at least we're using this philosophy as a way to think about um, how we are offered new perspectives um, expanded perspectives, multi-scalar perspectives um, that 
force us to decenter the human in our way of, of thinking about designing for the world. So when we're dealing with um, simulations and, and optimization and we're starting to engage with environmental um, uh, and social and, and climatic data, um, that we are really um, producing models that engage with, uh, well, a systems thinking approach really. Um, and, and sort of has those relationships to uh, network perspectives where we, we no longer have, have the needs. Um, resources are not seen simply for humans and we're starting to shift our perspective. And I think um, from, from uh, my point of view, that's um, definitely philosophy uh, gives us a forerunner to the use of our tools. It helps frame our worldview um, of why we should be using these tools and how we can can put them to use um, in order to address um, the massive challenges that we have today and to, I guess, um, reduce the impact or reverse the impact um, that humans have had uh, on the environment. And I think that um, Leo and I have certainly been engaging in some really um, exciting uh, discussions about how much um, uh, you know, whether John Dewey would have seen um, computational methods, because uh, obviously they didn't exist in his time, um, uh, you know, as, as sort of pragmatist tools and how we interpret um, the use of data, whether data in this context is actually an abstraction and it doesn't bring us closer to the real world. Um, so we've been having some really uh, interesting discussions about that. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No. No. Thank you. I I enjoyed the 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 presentation, and I uh, I put my paper right behind it because I think it follows along the same line that it is action that discloses the realities of nature that we're dealing with, and that mm -hmm. as you, you said, intelligence is not a product of the human mind, but a product of these interaction. I also like the term intelligence augmentation and using digital tools for that as a way to move forward. So I'm going to use that if if it's okay as a segue to move on to the next paper, um, which okay, is. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, which is one that uh, Garvin and myself wrote, which is uh, we're actually using a pavilion that we built as a demonstrator to uh, uh, illustrate philosophy. Um, um, so the paper is titled Designing with Uncertainty, Objectile Vibrancy in the Turu Bamboo Pavilion. And what this pavilion did is uh, it was an installation that we had designed and then a few days before the construction the construction materials were changed and yet we were able to continue with a radical change in performance of the materials and still arrive at a successful end product because the setup was done in a way that was very systematic. The whole design was basically a method statement. And what I mean with the title objectile vibrancy is that where if you look at Deleuze's term of the objectile, which means that you're no longer just designing one object, but you're designing the system that allows for multiple objects to come forward, which is one of the founding principles of the ideas of mass customization, that we can actually use the flexibility of these models to allow a more open-ended approach to a site and to the interaction with elements and, 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 and whatever comes at play during construction um, and, uh, and to allow the fluctuations there, which is what I call the vibrancy, to allow each project to basically snap into its singular final expression, which is then the automated, automatic outcome of the peculiarities and the idiosyncrasies of the site. So the argument here, building up on the pragmatist argument that Nicole mentioned earlier, is that we do not need to intend to control everything, but that we can use the uncertainties of a site as an opportunity to bring in different qualities and a different atmosphere in the built product that we have, which is an, 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 it's a counter argument to the increased control that computation um, can give. All right, I'll leave it at that for uh, this paper. So after these, these, these four papers that showed a uh, general approach, we have a few, we have two papers actually that are um, uh, trying to look at an analysis of our methods to understand their effectiveness and their, appropriate, uh, their appropriateness, sorry, a bit better. So I'll move to the first paper here, which is by Ki Hun Son, Hui Won Chun, and Kyung Hun Yun ambiguous versus concrete, identifying the effect of design references with various levels of details on designers' creativity in the early design phase. Are the authors here? And can they take over the microphone, please?
Uh, no, anybody here from that group? Hello. Hi, Kihon. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Yes, and let's start my presentation. And architectural designers want to make creative design solutions and utilize various design references in the in the design concept development process. And these design references have a significant impact on the outcome with design creativity and efficiency. However, previous studies have only suggested guidelines indicating that abstract reference is or are useful in the early design phase without the degree of design references level of detail. Therefore, this study aims to identify the impact of the level of detail of design references on design outcomes during the design concept development in a quantitative and qualitative way. We propose three different reference types, like the picture named abstract, hybrid, and concrete, and we conducted design experiments with the four participants who majored in interior architecture design. To solve the limitation of the research due to the exploration of design references, we develop and utilize floor plan retrieving tool to find and use the floor plan references in the design process. The experimental results show that there is a significant difference in design outcomes depending on the references level of detail. Through this study, we, had, we think we had a two contribution. First, we suggest a new method for assessing the design creativity of outcome based on the utilized design references in a quantitative way. Second, by using this method and design experiment, we propose the most useful design references level of detail in terms of the design creativity. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kihon. Yeah, I found it very interesting to actually statistically be able to prove the more uh, effective ways of doing uh, um, the early stages of the design. Um, so it's interesting to see the data back up uh, the intuition that I guess many architects uh, had. Um, thank you. Let's move on to the next paper, if that's okay, um, which is investigating site survey process with protocol analysis and then an extended FBS framework uh, by a team consisting of Yue Luo, Man Cheng Liang, Le Tong Gao, Yu Cheng Zhang, Cheng Shi Wang, and Xia Tzu. Is somebody from the team present? Nobody from the team is present. Okay, if nobody is here, well, I can I can just quickly sum it up in one sentence. So what this paper did is they um, um, they're statistically showing the effect of architectural education on the site surveying processes. So they're comparing different user groups uh, and and the effectiveness of the of the site analysis. I know I'm not doing justice to the paper with such a short description, um, but given that uh, the authors are not present, I'll use this opportunity to catch up some of the time that we are uh, behind in our schedule. No authors present? Okay, all right, then we move on. Um, then we have a, a small series of uh, people in this um, session that have still been working on some very specific uh, tool uh, developments. The first person here is Valdemar Marsecki um, with the paper Spatial Continuity Diagram. Um, and, and before we start, uh, Mr. Valdemar, I have to say I really enjoyed the uh, video presentation. Um, it was a, a very clear uh, and, and, and beautifully orchestrated uh, uh, um, display. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here, of course, only on, online, not personally, but, uh, but it's better than, than nothing. Um, um, my uh, article, um, uh, it's called Spatial Continuity Diagram. It's, um, how to say, it's um, some idea to, to prevent, to, to protest, maybe say it, protest against not a good developing uh, uh, new structures without, without any respect of uh, uh, tradition. Um, uh, my, my article and my short uh, movie, uh, I'm changing in three parts. 
first part, uh, I would try to, do, to explain the problem, the problem of uh, not harmony uh, buildings, uh, for example, existing in, uh, in Washington or in Toronto, in London, especially uh, as the uh, Tower of London completely disappeared in surrounding with the high high scrapers. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of uh, such, a, in my opinion, bad uh, solutions in, in, in relation between old and the new buildings in the old world. So for that reason, I decided to, to prepare a special method, a mathematical method, and a little bit statistic method to, to find some, um, some important elements of existing uh, buildings. Uh, to, uh, for example, the uh, elements of architecture, like for example, the roof shapes or uh, colors of elevations, existing buildings or uh, proportion of windows and a lot of uh, information. My, my program, it's a special software program, um, uh, um, calculate thousands of data and of course, the two parts. But well, first part, it's it's um, it's uh, information and actual architecture, and second part, it's it's information about the urban spaces. For example, uh, like uh, distance in between uh, cross streets uh, or or the, or sizes of markets and distances between the markets in existing buildings, and main. Uh, the idea is to prepare, you know, say, say it was, uh, such a guideline to, um, to, to, as a first step to um, develop a new buildings in a closer to old one, but uh, not as a copy of existing buildings, but as a, how to say, uh, uh, creative interpretation of the data. And most important is to because we can research existing buildings and the same method we can use to, um, to examine the project. Because we, we have, if we have finished, or uh, some one step of finished the project, we can ask the same questions like in existing buildings. For example, um, how is the distance between crosses uh, and, and so on. In, in that moment, we can compare the analysis of existing one and uh, and existing building and the project and uh, that software allows allowed to to show is the calculation of and uh, of of uh, data is the, a little bit the same or not if it's a little bit the same that maybe will be a the new project will be a continuation uh, of course not a copy but a continuation. Um, existing buildings, ex existing cities, for example, because it's, it consists of most pa most a part of a city, not three buildings, because no one can calculate it. But if we have thousands of buildings, for example, we, we can use that that program. And main idea is to 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 to, to find a way to to develop in a new modern style. And in a rush to modernity, not forget about the tradition, mm -hmm. because it's sources of our culture. Of course, the tradition of all countries, not general idea, but in different in Asia, for example, tradition different in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can we have caring about it, and for that reason, I prepare a special, I said, objective program who helps to find a good way to rep to. Evolution, not a revolution of 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 uh, developing. Of course, it's only my uh, opinion. Yeah, can I ask a question uh, very quickly because we don't have too much time anymore? Does your idea behind the tool that you developed to make that available to designers or to governments uh, or or building authorities to assess work that comes in, or both? Yeah, for all because uh, um, in in. in uh, Middle part, I forget it about it. I prepared a special um, a plan uh, to build uh, um, a new uh, settlement mm -hmm. uh, as a, how, to, how to say as a combination of right. one of the existing uh, 
part of a city, my city, uh, in just uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, Garnier. Yeah. Uh, and I, now it's building a very big uh, settlement as a rule in rules of, of, of that existing uh, very, very famous uh, part of, of my town. Right. So it's, it will be help for the planners, for designers, for, for governments, uh, for everyone who wants to, 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 to find a bridge between, between old and new. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to have to move on. I uh, wish we had more time to discuss. Thank you. Um, the next paper that we have is by uh, Vladeta Stojanovic, Benjamin Hagedorn, Matthias Trapp, and Jürgen Döllner, Ontology-Driven Analytics for Indoor Point Clouds. Hi, Christoph. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, hi, good morning. My name is Vladeta Stojanovic, and today I'll just talk about briefly about the paper I'm presenting this year at Cadre, which is ontology-driven analytics. And essentially, the problem that my research tries to address in this paper is we present a conceptual framework and system architecture for ontology-driven analytics of indoor point clouds. And what this means is that currently, within the realm of building information mod modeling or facility management um, and the built environment, the use of point clouds is becoming a very dominant sort of representation method for as-is representation of the built environment. However, point clouds themselves are very ambiguous, and therefore they require further processing using usually machine learning or deep learning methods in order to further semantically enrich them, to give them meanings. However, um, for most of these algorithms that are used for semantic enrichment, they require extensive configuration and are usually configured on a as-is basis for each specific use case. And therefore, every single time that you want to perform some sort of analysis on a capture of an indoor representation for a specific building, these algorithms need to be selected and reconfigured, and this takes quite a lot of time. Uh, so what I propose to do with this ontology driven framework is to create an ontology for a given building based on point cloud representation, where specifically if you input a point cloud from an unknown uh, built environment area, indoor area, for example, the system would automatically be able to select the appropriate algorithms for processing as well as the parameters uh, used for this. So therefore, for example, if you wanted to perform some sort of segmentation or identification of rooms and furniture for a given indoor point cloud representation, the system would be able to determine or infer from the given ontology built from previous use cases of the system, which appropriate methods would most likely be suitable um, to be applied for the given scene in order to semantically enrich it. So this is kind of a more um, lower level te technical representation because I come from a computer science and computer graphics background, not so much uh, architecture. But one thing I will leave off with as well is um, I read a recent, an interesting paper recently. This is actually from the from authors from the University of Hong Kong, so maybe Chris, if you know them, uh, they're from um, uh, Ying, Ying Ying Xu and Fan Xu, and this is a paper called Cognitive Facility Management. It's also a concept paper. It was published in Automation and Construction. I'll post a link to it. And what they talk about in this paper is with the use of also an ontology, but giving a cognitive, cognitive um, phase to facility management so that it's no longer just kind of a one-way process that's uh, being taken, being controlled by um, people with a technical expertise or facility managers, but also that the system is able to maintain itself and provide information to various different levels of stakeholders. And this is essentially what my sort of concept paper is, our concept paper is presenting, but on a much more practical and um, lower level. Yeah, no, great, thank you. Um, I think uh, it will definitely, it's, it's something that I think we're expecting to come become available in the coming years. It's great to see you pushing it because it would indeed uh, definitely facilitate and speed up certain workflows. Um, if you don't mind, um, I paired you with the following paper by Chun Man Tu and Jun Hao Ho from NCTU because uh, they're also working with point clouds. Um, yes. They're turning them in a, uh, a very easily usable sketch tool almost. So uh, the paper after abstraction before figuration, exploring the potential development of retopology and evolution reapplication of architectural form with three dimensional point cloud model generational logic. Um, and you how? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. So I, I will summarize my paper quickly. And in this research, our main purpose is to explore the possibility of the point cloud before it's used for reconstruction. So we use multidimensional information such as to the image and color channels to illustrate to change the visual effect and phone deviations from the point call model. And there are two main, op main operation stage. First is we try to integrate common point call analysis libraries such as Python PCL and Open3D into Grasshopper to pre-process the point call data. And then we use OpenCV to create a depth projection image to, so through this, image processing and point set registrations technology, the 2D image material can be used to select segment and sculptures, the complex and irregular regions of 3D point call models. So we hope that through this technology to change the information of different dimensional can be quickly integrated into point call models and also used for phone evolutions process. And instead of just use traditional design process, such as we need to draw a wireframe based on image and then generate solid object and finally combine different objects through a boolean operation. So we propose a new process for point cloud design. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, everybody who hasn't seen the video yet, have a look. It's very interesting to see the flexibility that would become possible with this. Some heat that we're starting to run very tight on time. So um, if you're okay, um, let's move on to the last paper that deals with uh, new tools and techniques before we go to the final one on future developments. Um, so here we have Sida Dai and Michael Kleiss, Shape Grammars in Computational Generative Design for Origami. Are the authors here? Oh, yeah. Hi. Yes, absolutely. So, well, let's take over. Um, I'll start by introducing a little bit the vision of the paper and what we're looking to achieve with this and in terms of our research. Um, what we found in reality is that there's a lot of um, background in the study of complex spatial forms that attracted a lot of attention from a number of um, artists and mathematicians since the inception of origami. So people have created a lot of skills um, to create origamis. And we have found a lot of theorems that are existing um, in terms of origami and computational origami as well. Uh, what we found was kind of a gap in then looking at these basic skills in terms of origami folds and the, and the possibility of us studying this using a shape grammar. So in particular, our study actually focuses on looking at a shape grammars to generate um, creased and fold patterns that could potentially be folded to new origami forms. And in this research, we are trying to find a balance between the manual origami design and the computer origami design. And the folding action in the manual origami is transformed into the shape grammar operation on the crease pattern. And firstly, the extracting the key folding action through the analysis of the origami. And then different shape grammar rules are designed to express the change of the crease pattern on each vertex. Finally, according to the theorem of origami further, to improve the syntax and set the terminal situation of the origami shape grammar. And this study discussed the relationship between origami crease pattern and folding skills from the perspective of shape grammar and apply the shape grammar rules to origami design to develop a low threshold origami design method. And in addition, this study also discussed the definition of uh, origami complexity and how to gradually increase the complexity of origami through a generative uh, design process. And um, among the important things that we found in this particular research is that on one hand, we can create a large number of new origami forms with the help of computers and expand actually the boundary of the origami science. Secondly, we found that providing designers an easy to use um, sort of entryway to um, use shape grammars as a design tool for crease patterns. Um, what's interesting is that you don't really know what you're going to create uh, using the shape grammar. So the aspect of predictability becomes kind of an interesting challenge, um, which allows for sort of a new surprise in terms of what can come out of it. 
Uh, what we find also is that the basics of the systematic study for understanding origami patterns, the trick grammars, could um, create a new branch of um, computer-aided origami design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was going to use this paper to give a, a link to the first paper, uh, Mass Tailorization, where they're um, advocating for more computation in order to filter through the infinite amount of options that we can create. Um, unfortunately, the authors, authors are not here. Um, but it's definitely interesting to see how this uh, paper opens up the uh, design solution space of what you can achieve uh, through shape grammar uh, with origami. So thank you so much. Um, then we'll move on uh, to the very last paper. Um, we're a bit over time, but we started a bit late. So um, Candy, please uh, feel free to take it away. Um, Kadri at 25, Mapping Past, Present and Future of Computer Aided Architectural Design Research in Asia. Candy, Madam President, are you present? Thanks a lot, everybody. And um, uh, I want to make it very brief because the key diagram of the paper is actually already on the screen. Um, the, um, the paper is a kind of a look into the history of Cadria, taking this 25th anniversary conference as an opportunity to reflect back a little bit what has happened. And the idea was to come up with a visual history of the organization a little bit in the same spirit as uh, Charles Jenks' uh, history of architecture in the 20th century diagram that probably most of you being architects already know. So I did this uh, based on the keywords of research papers um, archived on HumanCAD. However, this has only been done since 2008. Um, but even during that time, we can already see quite a bit of change um, that the organization is experiencing. So it's uh, only 11 years, but you already see that the kind of topics that we were talking about in 2008 are quite different to the topics we are talking about last year um, and uh, probably also this year. So we have gone away from more diversity um, that we had in 2008, uh, much more focus on, let's say, design process, design methodology, design theory, and um, the most popular keywords today in Cadria um, focus mostly around uh, the technical paradigms that promise utility. So we see a lot more fabrication and uh, BIM and um, a little bit in the generative design and uh, computational design so uh, areas. So if I want to make it very short, I have to be as brief. Um, but uh, of course, the story is a bit longer. The story is about our discipline becoming more professional and being influenced much more than before by the availability of funding and funding normally big time funding goes to people who promise uh, utility uh, in the wider sense. So um, the questions the paper is asking is, uh, you know, um, what is Cadria uh, as a community and what kind of things are we talking about? Because the aims that we started out with 25 years ago are not uh, reflected um, as clearly in our current output as they once were. So for example, our big educational agenda um, has uh, fallen by the wayside. And um, also the paper um, does a little bit of speculation on where we are going. And I just want to say very sh briefly, it will very, very likely uh, be tied even more than right now um, to uh, the, um, the funding preferences of the main funding agencies um, in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Candy. I really, I want to thank you a lot for writing this paper because, it, because I think it's incredibly timely and it's an, also an incredibly useful tool for the next generation of researchers because um, um, it's not easy once you're, when, you, when you're in the trenches to have the overview that you're, that you're presenting with it here. And it's incredibly shocking actually to see the results. Um, and I agree with your assessment uh, of the reasons behind it, um, that indeed there is a greater drive towards uh, utilitarian research coming from the funding bodies. But for many of the grants that I guess we all can apply for, I'm not familiar with the whole environment, but at least here in Hong Kong, impact is definitely something that they're looking for, and that would be utilitarian, but innovation and novelty as well. And by having a diagram like this available um, in your applications, you can identify how 
research gaps are starting to reappear in the overall body of knowledge due, due to a lack of attention. And I think having a diagram like this available to argue and to, uh, in a factual manner, uh, prove that there is a research gap in the interest that you have, I think this could be a very powerful tool in grant applications. So that's why I, I kept it at, as, as a final paper for the session as well, because it ties back to uh, what Nadia uh, earlier was talking about as well. And I think it's especially in the, uh, the, the session on theory and methodology and philosophy, I think it is important to zoom out and make sure that we don't uh, lose some of the most more precious fruits along the way. That, that's quite ironic because you say theory, philosophy and so on, and you actually see that we are not really talking about this uh, a lot anymore. We used to do it much more. If you look at the topics, for example, in 2008, 2009, and you see that the whole idea of design theory, design process, even protocol analysis, uh, education, methodology, this had a much, much bigger part to play in uh, Cadria when you look at the distribution of keywords. Yeah, indeed, a call to arms, a call to arms. Okay. Well, no, maybe we have to re, uh, rethink our aims then. Uh, this is a very uh, provo provocative question I will ask uh, to uh, Kadria in the next two years. Uh, where are we going? Are we revising our course or are we adapting uh, the label of Kadria? Whichever direction we're going, the diversity should be maintained. Mm -hmm. um, that's an important thing to take out. Okay. Um, I can leave it open for one minute until we all get kicked out. If anybody of the panelists still want to make a comment, um, maybe to this last paper. Um, yes, if possible. Yes. Uh, can, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add to what you just both said is that um, to me, looking at an, a larger uh, sample of the current computational field, it's not only calorie, it's very much everywhere where you see this uh, utilitarian drive. This um, so. I interpret it as a role for rationalization where we push um, uh, quantitative optimizations rather than maybe looking at in general what it would mean to automate decision making that architects usually do. Um, and I very much think it's something we should get back to before um, trying to optimize everything is basically asking what does it mean to have uh, optimized architecture. Um, and yeah, the, the word of optimization is very much used those days, so I take it as an example, but I think it's present actually everywhere, not only in Cadria. And so I, I very much agree with uh, Christian Thurs' question of where do we go now and shouldn't we have a bit more diversity in, in what we look at? Okay. Thank you very much, Naja, for that uh, closing. Thank you. We're, we're running in the break a little bit, so uh, I'll end it here so that everybody can still grab a coffee before uh, session nine on artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, starts. Thank you, everybody, for participating and for the discussion and the paper submitted. See you soon. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Thank bye. you. Thank you.